thanks to Archbishop Henry. Astonishingly, thanks to Abbot Henry's advanced... Fairground socks. So it's like fairground socks for sort of... Oh, I've lost... This is called talking. We make words with our mouth. A three, a try... I can't think of the word. Partide agreement. <laughs> It is. Make of that what you will. Yes, yes, yes. These are finished. Yes. <laughs> and my favourite yarn. Oh, that's amazing ribbon. Oh, wow. Well. Normally, I panic. If you look back through it's Bakery really Bear's neat, video really. show episodes, when Kay starts to do this, you might start to see me <laughs> becoming a bit flustered. That we're going to be exploring over the next two episodes. Oh, man, why can't I get this? No, you always look closely, but normally it's because I've done something wrong. Yeah, there this is, time. you did miss a twist there. Though. Yes, yes, see? Welcome, everybody, to the Bakery Bears video show featuring a brand new episode of The Rise and Fall of the Monasteries. Now, do we have an exciting announcement for you? I do. Because, yes, at the start of this year, I think it was February this year, we began this series, The Rise and Fall of the Monasteries, and we had no idea if you were going to enjoy it or not. It's different to what we've done before, mm. whilst being similar. Yeah. That was always our sort of goal, was to take walking the wall... And to sort of turn it into something new and exciting. Well, we're just thrilled, beyond thrilled, that you've been loving it. You have, you have. And little did you know that through the course of this series, I've been cutting lots of stuff. Yeah. Because basically, I was just getting too much filming. And it never really sort of... I didn't really think too much about it. I just thought, oh, you know, it's just the nature of filmmaking. And sometimes those extra bits went out when it made sense in our special gold editions. So we put out special gold editions to our gold and platinum Baker Bear patrons, like the director's cuts. So some of those sort of additional bits are in there. But sometimes the additional bits just didn't make sense in the final cut. So they just disappeared. And I sat down to write this episode that you're going to see today. And... I got to the, the amount of shots which it takes to produce an episode and I told about much less than half of the story and suddenly it all sort of clicked into place in my head. I turned to Kay and I said, do you know what? I think we should do two episodes. Yeah. So yes, today is the first part of a two-episode special. It's a two-parter. Yes, it's a two-part attack. Two-part attack. What was that from? That was Mr. Maker. Right. Oh, you see, was I'd have a, gone... Was it a three-part attack? No, it was a two-part attack. Was it a two-part attack? Yes. Mr. Maker, a children's yes. programme from a few years ago. Yeah. Wasn't he also Mr. Like a Biker from Grandpa in My Pocket? I think he was. Yes, yes. It was in, I used to, we used to love I... No, me, no. me and Bryony, yes, no, I. You were correct. <laughs> you still have Grandpa in my pocket. That was a great programme. James Bolan. James Bolan. Brilliant actor. Yeah, that was in the day when CBeebies used to produce good shows. It's not so much anymore. Not got. quite so much. No, no. Forget all that, though, because it's time to get excited for this first ever two-parter from any mm. one destination that we've ever done. In the first episode, which you're going to see today, we're going to tell the story of... Really, the, we said this last time, it's, it, it's the crown jewels of monastic houses, many historians mm. say in Europe, and it's Fountains Abbey, I shall tell you. We're going to tell the story of Fountains Foundation and its sort of rise, and then in the second episode, we'll tell the story of it at its heyday. Yeah. And what is going to happen over the course of these two episodes is we're going to start to join the dots of the whole series, and we're going to bring it. I used to love join the dots. I used to do it on dot holiday. Dot to dot, dot you to mean, dots. not join yeah. the dots. Sorry, dot to dot, dot to dot. Dot to dot. And yeah. as we get to the final episode, episode 10 now, not a nine episode series, episode 10, we shall have made the picture and yeah. it will all make sense. My goodness, another amazing announcement, and that is, I can feel autumn in the air. It's there. It's there. It's beyond exciting. 
I went for a run the other day, and it's really happened in the last week, because it was, maybe it was just yesterday. I think it was it yesterday was. you said it to me, yeah. Yesterday I went out for a run. You can tell, first thing in the morning, mm. because of the, the way the air feels. Yeah. feels a bit cooler. A bit cooler. And mm. also the light. Yeah, the light has changed, definitely. Yes. It's darker in the morning, and it's darker earlier at night yes. now. Yes, Which is... Very exciting. Yes. It's still really warm th- through the day at the moment. It's been sort of around 20, 23, but not humid. So it's been all right, isn't it? The whole summer has been more the than acceptable. The whole summer this year has been just fantastic. I'll have a summer like this every year, please. Welcome to the English summer. <laughs> Lots of rain. It won't last. No, it won't it? last. It won't last. And look, it, it, there probably will be some warmth to come. Yeah, we do often get warm weather sort of late September, don't we? It's so, like that Indian summer thing going on. You know, on. but I shall, I shall lay down the gauntlet now. There shall be no complaints from us. No. Oh, why do I think I've made a mistake? No, later? well, no, I don't mind it so much at that time of year because you know it's short-lived. Yes. You know, it's not going to go on for months. And look, look, we are beginning to find the, hello Michael, appreciation <laughs> in summer because... Our first ever rose is out. Look oh, at this. Oh. Goodness. Oh my goodness. Yes. We've recently been doing, well, we've done lots of gardening recently, actually, and I bought a couple of David Austin roses. The one that you're looking at right now is called England's Rose. Isn't it beautiful? And it's a David Austin rose. We do have another one called Roll Dahl, which is a peach rose. And that but, one's also been flowering. But the wind blew. But, right, oh, it's devastating. <sighs> It had the most beautiful flower on, the Roald Dahl, which I did post a picture on Instagram, actually, of. And then the following day, it was really windy, and it blew all the petals off. <sighs> oh, it's I was all like, too much. oh, no, I wanted to look at it a bit longer. So it was super windy. I think because as well, I think they can resist a certain amount of wind. I think they're quite resilient, these particular ones of David Austin. But it's newly planted. It's only been in a few weeks, so it's still getting established. And the wind just like, all the little petals went everywhere. I was like, oh. (laughs) It's just so frustrating. But, you know, there'll be absolutely loads of you out there who know exactly what we're talking about. And we'll probably have the most wonderful, huge, great established gardens. We're just sort of taking our first Mm. baby steps. Mm. And so what has been wonderful for both of us is knowing that we're doing the right thing because we're both really into it. We've done it together, haven't we? And we've just absolutely loved it. Yeah. It's just been so... It's been a bit of a revelation for us, you know, in terms of another thing that we've been doing together. Yeah. And I had no idea that you would be loving it as much. You know, now I find myself going out in the garden at like half past five in the morning when I get up. I'm like, oh, I'll just go and check on my roses. We planted a couple of roses, a potent tiller, a few other things as well that I've got a few flowers on. So I was like, oh, I'm just going to go and have a look and see if they're okay. So I'm out there at half past five in the garden just having a little look. And, you know, it's quiet then, obviously, so it's really pleasant. Yeah. So it's just been fantastic. We're absolutely loving it. Yes. And who knows, perhaps we've planted a seed that might grow into something Maybe rather special. Maybe we have. Who knows? Who knows? Now, look, yes, summer, lovely, lovely and all that jazz, but we're all about the autumn. Yes. And as we get ready for autumn, it's time to start getting excited about our next great knit along. Yes. Now we'll be talking about this a little bit in Andy Bits, I we suppose. We will. We will, because it's very soon now. Yes. We're starting a really fun knit along for everybody for the month of September. Yes. So, yeah, we'll talk all about that in Endy Bits. And what's it called, the knit along? It's a self striping knit along. So, yes. it's September self striping. Ooh. Or self striping in September. I've not thought of the. <laughs> Not thought of the exact name yet. I quite like self striping in September. Yeah, funny. yeah, it was something like that. It was yeah, something it was cute. Fun. But yeah, we'll talk about that later. And also, whilst our great summer of stitching is in the process of coming to an end, it yeah. sort of has come to an end already. We are now, the, the, the wheels are turning for our next great patron event, yes. which is in October. And we'll yes. touch a little bit on that as well at the end of the show. But we'll also talk lots about that in our next patron exclusive show, which is coming up this Sunday. Yeah. But again, more details about that later yeah. on in the show. Absolutely. Because forget all of that 
in what's off my needles, Kay is showing the final Platinum Collection yes. pattern of 2023. Yes, <gasps> and I'm going to tell you the name <gasps> now. I've kept it secret. It's the collection within the collection. It's super cute. Just the business. Gonna love it. So to get to that, we have lots to do. So I think without further ado, I should say, Kay Jones, what's on your needles? Right, so this is very exciting. I've got a new pair of socks. And this pair of socks requires several other of my previous knitted items to explain how this pair of socks came about, right? So first of all, the yarns that I'm using, this was a happy accident. I went into my stash one day because I was, I was swatching for something. I can't even remember what it was. And I just needed a couple of yarns that contrasted well with, with each other for this swatch. So I just went into my stash and I literally just grabbed two yarns that I thought, oh, they're pretty, they'll do. And, you know, did this swatch and I thought, gosh, they look really nice together. I'm going to have to do something with those two yarns. That was like a few weeks ago and I didn't have time right then to do it. But then about, I don't know, maybe a week, two weeks ago, I thought, right, okay, I'm going to get those yarns. I'd actually put them into a bag, a project bag ready because I just loved them so much when I, I did this little swatch. I thought, right, I'm going to use these two yarns to make a pair of socks in a striped fashion, but just two colours. And I thought, well, you know, you know me and liking to add a little bit of something in there to give it a bit, a bit more interest for me. And whenever I knit anything, I kind of like to do something different and new. I never really like to repeat myself too much. So when I, I got these two yarns, I thought, right, OK, I'm going to figure out a way of striping them so that I get even stripes all the way down to the toe. So what I do for that, and I've, I've spoke about this before, and I have done a tutorial, a Patreon tutorial about this, in creating a... I think it's... In the, in the tutorial, I use it in an advent way. So how to create your own advent calendar of yarn to then make into a sock. But I've used the same principles, it's just that the stripes in this are much thicker. Because it's just two colours, I just thought it'd be nice if the stripes were nice and chunky. So I finished one sock, so I'll show you the sock and then I'll tell you how the little stitch pattern that I've put in um, on the stripes came about. So here we go. Oh, it's so pretty, look at the colours. So it's orange and pink, and who knew, really, that they would go together? But I suppose, I suppose if you think about it, some oranges do have pink in. You know, when an orange is more peachy, it does have pink in it. So they are associated in that respect. But it's just so lovely, and it's these chunky stripes. And can you see at the colour change, there's like a little bit of, a little bit of fancy business, let's call it. Well, this little bit of fancy business, I thought I'd done it before. And I knit it and I thought, oh yeah, I think that looks like the cowl that I knit last Christmas. And I made this advent cowl. These were all yarns that I dyed myself. These are the winter solstice themed yarns, if you remember this cowl. And each of the colour changes, again, there's like this little detail. But after I'd done it on the sock, I thought, no, it isn't quite that. So then I thought, maybe it's what I did on my tinsel socks. Because again, that was a similar sort of thing. These are, this is a pattern that's available to purchase. So these are my tinsel socks. And again, you can see where you change colours. This is a mini skein set. Where you change colours, there's a little bit of detail going on. So when I compared them, I thought, no, it's not that either. <laughs> and lastly, I thought, maybe it's my dandelion socks. Now, this is a design from years ago. It's a patron design. And I went and dug these out because actually these have never been worn. I gave them to Bryony. But for whatever reason, she never wore them. I don't know why. Because they're beautiful. This is a Nicole C. Mendez colour. So you can see again, there's a little bit of something going on. This is a self-striping every time you change the colour. But again, 
it's not quite the same. So I thought, right, okay, I haven't done this before, <laughs> but it's along the same lines. It's just each time you change colour, in this case, you just do two rows of something and it produces like a little bit of texture. And in, in the case of this one, it makes, it looks a bit like stitching. Like with the previous colour, you've sort of run a line of running stitches through the new colour. Can you see that? And it's really pretty. The other thing that really made me happy knitting these is when I, I can show you on this little bit of information here. So when I was sort of planning this out and I jotted down what I was going to do, I was looking at the colour placement and I was working out how many stripes I would get down the sock. So I drew a little sock and then I just put P-O, P-O for pink and orange where I was going to place them. And I realised when I did it that it spells out pop down here. Pink, orange, pink, orange. So I started calling them my pop socks. And of course that's got an association with us because we do our patron only show that we do once a month live is the pop show, patron only podcast. So I was like, oh, this is like some kind of like worlds colliding situation that made me just absolutely love these. So these are now my pop socks. So I think what I'm going to do with this, because I haven't done this little stitch pattern before, I thought what I will do is I will make this pattern, I think I'll make it the first platinum pattern for, well, it's effectively the second. I'll make it the platinum pattern for March next year. And then, because, you know, I haven't done it before on any of those designs that I thought I had, because I think when I, when I knit it, I thought, oh yeah, I know what to do. I, I remember what I did on something else. I couldn't think at the time what it was. But of course it's not, it's an accidental thing. A happy accident, very much a happy accident. So yeah, I'm when I finish this pair, I think that's what I will do. I will write up the pattern and I will get this ready as a platinum pattern for next year. So that'll be really fun. But the yarns that I used, these are two yarns I dyed myself. Now the pink, this was a yarn that I dyed up as part of a set that I sent to a friend to knit some swirly woo socks. There was this lovely pink and there was like a sort of mulberry. It was this sort of color. Do you see this sort of red? It was a bit more purple, I think. But it was sort of this red and I, I did two skeins of each so I had this pink in my stash and then the orange I have no clue why I know that it's a I know that I've dyed this I know it's one of mine but I can't remember for the life of me why I've dyed this I've just got a darning needle stuck in it look because I was sewing in ends it's lovely and historically I've not been much of an orange person you know I've never been that much of a fan of the colour orange but just lately I really like orange and especially when you pair it with other colours and you know you get something like that it's just such a joy when you get just such a lovely happy accident like this in this case but what I did in in this sock is my stripes are 16 rounds each because that number works perfectly for the length of foot that I do and so I knew I had exactly four repeats to do down the foot and I really like how this orange stripe here this is what ended the leg so I used it and went straight into the heel turn heel flap and turn with the orange and then picked the pink back up here when I finished the turn and I really like how that looks. It gives it a sort of, not symmetry, but because there's there's only four stripes of orange and there's five of the pink. But what it does adding it into the heel is it makes it look more balanced, I feel, in terms of the colours. So I have got the second one on the go. I've literally just cast it on. The other thing to say is the needles I'm using, actually. So here's the second one. Can you see these needles? 
how lovely and pink they are. I bought these recently with the intention, did I, I think I mentioned it last time actually. Yeah. yeah, with the intention of using them for that Barbie yarn that I dyed up, but it turned out they were exactly the same color as the Barbie yarn, so that was never gonna work. So I decided to use them for the for these socks, and it's the L liquor, is that how you say that? And it's the blush set. I'm using two and a half millimetre because I knit a bit tighter on DPNs. So I'm using two and a half millimetre. They're wooden. When I first started using them, I didn't like them at all. The main two reasons there are for that is that one is that they're very bendy. As wood goes, they're incredibly bendy. I'm not gonna do that for fear of breaking them, but I've used wooden needles quite a lot. And these are the, the sort of most flexible that I've ever used. That's fine for me because I don't tend to, I've never broken a wooden needle, but I know some people if you are a very tight knitter, and I know you, I have. you would break wooden. Oh, I have you broken wooden. Yeah, yeah. So, but like I said, that's not so much of an issue for me. But I kind of don't like <coughs> how much they flex when I'm knitting. But the other thing that I didn't like, and this has kind of worked its way out, luckily, is that on the needle itself, and I'm not sure whether this is going to show. It probably won't. It's sort of a bit too close up. But the size of the needle is in the middle and it's written in sort of a gold print. You can see, with the naked eye, you can see that what they've done is like a transfer and there's like a band here where the transfer has been put around the needle. And what that caused is that, you know, it was smooth, smooth, smooth and then it, it would stop dead here. My, my stitches would stop dead because it was so much more grippy over this bit where this transfer had been put on. I presume it's some sort of transfer. And I thought, at first I, I thought, I, I did the rib on the other one. I thought, I don't like these needles. I'm gonna ditch them and try some others. But I thought, no, I'm gonna persevere because what I know what happens with wooden needles is that as you use them, they kind of polish. The yarn sort of polishes them and they get more, much more pleasant and smooth and a bit slicker to knit. To knit. And that luckily has happened and now it's not so much of a problem. You know, I can run my finger over the needle and it doesn't drag over that middle bit. So I thought I'd mention that in case you've had that issue and you've thought, I'm not gonna use these, I don't like that. Persevere and that does wear down. But whether I'll use these again or not, mm, I'm not sure. They're not my favorite wooden needles. They're nice and pointy, this set anyway. I bought two sets and the other set are not as pointy. But I'm going to finish the pair using them and, you know, they are now perfectly fine to use. So I'm loving those and I've got them in my all-time favourite, well, it's definitely one of my all-time favourite project bags. This is from Emma at Moo and Mouse. And it's a Halloween-themed bag. But what I love is that the socks kind of match because we've got that pink and orange in the back. It's just everything, everything was just lovely about this project. So, Dan Jones, what's on your needles? Is this bag autumn do you think? Yes. Yes. You see, it's in my autumn bag. Yes. Yes, I thought it was. I knew there was a reason why I was drawn to this bag yeah. at this time of year. It's very autumn -y. It's just lovely. And I always put in one of my favourite garment projects in this bag. It's the business. Mm -hmm. One of my favourite garment projects is, of course, the Roosty Tank Top. And yes. I've knitted on it loads, but it just doesn't look like it because there's so many stitches. Yeah, yeah, and the yarn's so fine and... I'm nearly through the second repeat. I mean... Are you measuring? Oh, that's not too bad, actually. Yeah, actually, yeah. this this jumper's not a bad length. We could measure this jumper yeah, yeah. and then we'll know how yes. much further. But I don't, I definitely don't want this long, so... Well, I'll be finished. Even slightly cropped would be all right because I'll have a shirt on underneath which will poke out the bottom. Well, I've got... W when I finished the colour work motif, because you do it twice, Yeah. One of, and it's Ella Gordon Designs, really great design, really easy to read, it's all lovely. Really couldn't compliment it any more so far. Once I'm through this repeat, I suspect I'll probably be long enough. Yeah. And that's pretty cool. That's brilliant. Oh, and... I know the colours. The reason I was struggling to work out the colours is because I think the colour names have changed. Because what was on the ball band was different to what's now on the Jameson and Smith website. 
connected with that number and it's definitely the same colour. So I've taken these names from the Jameson and Smith website. So we've got Morit, which is the dark brown. We've got Pinky Fawn, which is that sort of beige-ish, fawn-ish sort of colour. We've then got Light Fawn, which is the sort of creamy colour. Dark Red, which is the dark red. And then Mid Mild Pink, which is the pinky colour. Excellent colour so, descriptions. Yeah, I mean, that's the names of them. Thank you. So they do sort of describe the colour, don't they? Yes, and um, they're great. Yeah. They're, they're really great to work with. What's interesting is the yarn on this project is the same as the yarn on the Aaron Harper Gansey. That one doesn't give very much, and this one feels just fine. I mean, it's very strange because you would have they're, thought. Yeah, they're both two plies. So this one yeah. that Dan's working with now is the two ply jumper weight, and the other one is an Aaron, and that's also a two ply. They are very different, and they do feel very different. Maybe it's because it's thicker and it doesn't. I don't know, but anyway, but, it's lovely to work with and it's great for colour work. Mm. I would say it feels even better than Let Lopi for colour work. It's just it's just lovely, isn't it? Yeah. I can't wait to wear it. And it, Oh, I'm going to look so cool. I, I know. I feel like I need to go in a woodland and have a photo taken when this is finished. Definitely. We can do. Yes so pretty yes it is a really lovely project to work and definitely a challenge because the, the, the some of the rows are really quite complicated yeah. and sometimes you've got more than one color on the go which is quite cool the more than two i meant to more say more than two uh, which i really like and it's a sort of nice toe in the water of of, yeah. of doing that yeah. which is really cool so it's the roosty tank top it's elegant designs and it's great fun and Beautiful. I highly recommend it. Yeah, I can't wait till it's finished. Yeah. It's, it's going to be well, that a sort of heirloom thing. Yes, definitely. I'll just, I'll just have forever. Well, I it'll think definitely lovely, last. This yarn is robust, mm. to say the least. Yeah, it'll definitely last. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. What else is on your needles? So, my second thing is my second reading shawl that I'm making for Bryony. I am now about halfway through. So this shawl, if you remember when I showed my other completed one, is a design of mine which is currently in testing, but very excitedly, I think it will be ready for release on the next video show. Fingers so two weeks? Yes, so a couple of weeks. So fingers crossed, if all carries on going well with the test knit, touch wood, it will be, um, you know, I'll be talking about this as a released pattern on the next show. But this one for Bryony, I started a little, um, I don't know, maybe a month or so ago. I have shown you this before, but I'd really just barely started, I think, the last time I showed you. And I'm now, or uh, I've put in one, two, three, four, five, six colour stripes, and I'm almost ready for the seventh. So this is where I'm up to now. Oh, I just love how these colours are looking. So we started off with this lovely brown. And this brown was a yarn that I used to knit Bryony's boyfriend some fingerless mitts earlier this year. So I thought it might be nice to put that yarn in as a starting point. And then I, she wanted purples, blues and greens, those kinds of colours. So I moved into this deep purple, but it does have a lot of specks of this brown colour in it. So that sort of linked through into the purples. And then we've got a sort of brighter, deeper purple, a purple with sort of a bit of pink in as well. And then a lighter purple, which has got some blues. And then that moved me through to the start of the, the blue section, which is, this is definitely blue, but there is some purple in it. So I'm trying to do a nice progression through the colours. But I do quite like having a bit of sort of contrast. So, you know, we've got very dark colours up here. And then this one's quite light. I've got another light one coming after this blue, and then it might move back into sort of more darker colours. I do like having that sort of light and dark thing going on. I think it adds a nice bit of interest rather than having sort of the same tones going all the way through. So the coloured stripes are primarily minis from Pixie Yarns. I am putting in a few others because I didn't quite have enough in the right colours of Pixie Yarn this time for this one. 
because I didn't have another advent calendar. I previously used an advent calendar from Pixie Yarns. So I have been putting in a few other minis as well. And I do need a couple more greens. I ordered actually some today, a little mini set, which I'll show you next time, but I had a couple of greens in, so I'm hoping they might work. So yeah, I'm, I've done six coloured sections and the background, the contrast background colour, I dyed myself and it's this lovely sort of silvery, slightly lilac-y colour. It's really pretty. And this is what I've got left of my first two 100 gram skeins of the contrast. So I'll end up using, I think with my first shawl, I ended up using something like 340-ish or something grams of the contrast colour. You basically need 400 grams of the contrast and then you'll have a good bit left over. So I dyed up four skeins of this and these are my first two. I reckon I've probably got 30 or 40 grams left of those, but it, it disappears really rapidly when your rows start to get really long, which, which they are now. So the next two colours that will be going in are these, and one of them is Pixie Yarns and one isn't, and I can't remember where I got the other one, but this variegated is Pixie Yarn, and this one, I can't rem I don't know where They're this one lovely. is. They're lovely. Aren't they pretty? They're just going to look so lovely marled together. So I can't wait to get those in. So that's the next two colours. So I'm in that blue phase at the minute, and then it will end with a few greens at the bottom. So really, really loving knitting this again. I'm using four and a half millimetre and a, my much loved higher, higher bamboo interchangeables, which are just fantastic. I love these needles. They're really cool, aren't they? They're brilliant and they spin. They spin in the cable, which is fantastic, I think, especially for larger projects where you're moving it around like this. To have the needles spin, I think is just great. So I'm absolutely loving it and I love how it looks in these more sort of autumnal colours. Um, lovely Amy Exterminate on Instagram, I'm sure a lot of you follow her. She's a beautiful knitter. I, I sent her the pattern just as a gift. She's not officially testing it or anything like that, I just wanted to send her the pattern. But she started knitting it, she was like, oh, I really want to start. And she posted a picture recently and she's using all sort of autumnal shades and it looks absolutely fantastic so if you follow amy i'm sure you've seen it but maybe go and have a look if you haven't it's it's gorgeous so yeah i will hopefully be talking more about this on the next show so if you you know you're interested in knitting one of these then start gathering your yarns you need a, well, I used an advent calendar of mini skeins, so you will need 24 times 20 grams of yarn for the coloured section, and then you'll need four 100 gram skeins for the contrast. All fingering weight. Doesn't have to be the same base. I think people of, often ask me that, actually. Does it need to be the same base? And I don't think it really does, especially when it's a project like this, which is designed for either you know, a set of minis or scraps, leftovers. So I don't think the base has to be the same. As long as it's all fingering weight, then I'd say you're fine. Check your yardage is what I would say, because some fingering weight has less yardage than others. And I do quote the yardage that you need in the pattern. But other than that, yeah, you can mix your bases, I would say. So lovely, lovely reading shawl. I am still knitting my cable and twist socks and I love them and Bryony tried them on and they fitted which is even better yeah and so the first one is looking rather lovely mm. and the second one is now well on on the go as well I'm actually through the heel turn which is really exciting but what I love about these socks is the yarn it's really nice the it? color is just mm. uh, I just love it how did this colour come about? Oh, now you're asking. I mean, it's just like every stitch looks a different... It's either pink or purple. <laughs> yeah, it's because it's... you. I dyed it using like that over-dye technique, which I've shown, I think, right. several times. So it's... I can't even remember what two colours I used, but basically it's a purple and then a pink right. over-dyed on top, and you get that kind of violet colour. It's amazing. It's really lovely and it does produce a really lovely sort of tone, really lots of tones in there. It can't beat it. 
No, it's, it's super pretty. I think I might have... In fact, I'll check my recipe book because I think I might have called this Sugar Plum. Right. It might have yeah. been Sugar Plum. I've does seen that, that name. Does that right? That yeah. name does sound really familiar. Yeah, yeah. Well, it, it's been absolutely lovely to knit these socks with. And it, that, for me, is such a key thing. And I think it is for a lot of people. Mm. Because if the yarn... It is for me. If the colour is a bit boring, yeah. or if the colour is a bit... Uh, standard I find if I've got like one colour that looks the same it just becomes flat. like yeah you mean if it's a flat colour I'm color. rubbish at describing yeah. things like that a flat colour I find really hard to work with yeah I just don't find it interesting at all I think and I, I have used yarns like that but the only time I use a yarn that is like that is if like maybe there's more than one colour going on in the design yeah. or there's lots of pattern going on so you've got interest somewhere else. So it's like an ingredient rather than yeah, the main focus. Yeah, yeah. Whereas something like this, if you are, you know, knitting a pair of socks, whether it's got a pattern in it or not, surely what you want is you want a yarn which is constantly like making you go ooh yeah. and ah and all of those lovely I things. I certainly do. Yeah, yeah. And but that's just your second one. You combine that really too well. with the the lovely stitch pattern, which again is really sort of designed by Kay specifically to work yeah. out elements of my knitting. Yeah. And it really has been stretching for me because there's a lot going on, which is quite cool. That's amazing ribbon, I oh, mean, well. to say. Normally, I panic. If you look back through really Bakery Bear's video ribbon. show episodes, when Kay starts to do this, you might start to see me <laughs> becoming a bit flustered because that normally means she's about to say, no, you've done something wrong. It's super neat. Cause In one... fact, this might be the first time She's ever started looking closely. No, I always look closely. <laughs> no, you always look closely, but normally it's because I've done something wrong. Yeah, there this is, time, you did miss a twist there. Though. Yes, yes, see? It took 232 <laughs> episodes, but after 232 episodes, she has finally picked up a sock his, his, and said... Look how neat his ribbing is, it's one by one as well, which can be tricky. I think you've done a fantastic job with the ribbing. Tricky. <laughs> tricky. I've been knitting loads of one by one ribbon lately yeah. because I, a I love it. I I think we've said we spoke about ribbon recently, didn't yeah, we? we? Did, yeah. You can't stand two by two no, ribbon, no, no, no. but you don't mind one by one love because one by one. it's well, got a no, much don't love. No, find it acceptable and can knit it. It's got a kind of melodic rhythm rhythm to it. If you want to delve deeply into music and knitting and motivation, go watch. The, the episode that came out yesterday ah. of Self-Contained Knitter, which was called Knitting, Music and ah. Motivation. And I speak wow. at length about the rhythmic nature of knitting oh, and how right. it links directly to, yeah, to yeah, drumming yeah. and music as a whole and how that then provides motivation if something mm. has rhythm mm. to make you want to knit through it. But it's interesting because this is like a ribbed design... But look at look how skinny it is when you knit it, and then yeah. that's obviously how it blocks, yeah. which is just amazing, isn't it? Really? And the the technique with dyeing this yarn does mean that you do tend to get one half of the skein a little bit more, you know, a slightly different shade to the other. Right. Which is not always my favourite thing, but you know, in this circumstance, I don't mind at all. And it just goes down to the technique. It's when you, you are, without going into too much detail, but when you drop the yarn into the water, inevitably that first bit of the skein is going to get more dye than the bit at the top. So I do try to get it in there quick, but still, you know, you do tend to get a bit of that. But, you know, it's a hand-dyed yarn, isn't it? We've not got any pooling, so we're OK. It looks phenomenal. You're talking it's a, it's, total rubbish. OK. It's the truth. All right. It looks <laughs> tremendous. It does. I love. I love it. And I, I understand I completely don't... what you're saying. And obviously, what you're saying is going to be right. I don't know because I'm I, not that clever. I don't but mind. This at yarn all. looks tremendous. I don't mind at all that when it's like this. It's just the, the pooly. I'm not going to go on about pooling again. But yeah, but it's beautiful. You're doing a great job, and you're nearly finished. Yes. Good man. I know. So, and when I pulled this out of the bag, I dropped a load of needles. Uh, dropped a load of needles. Oh, dropped no. a load of stitches, but I fixed it. <gasps> oh, you fixed it? Are yeah, you sure? I'm positive. Right, okay. I'm no longer an idiot. Well. Well. <laughs> on that occasion. What else is on your needles? Okay. So the last thing is another pair of socks. 
in your lovely bag, which oh, you created yes. in last year's. Oh, do you know? Well, you didn't create the bag. You created the cross stitch. Is that right? It's not a cross stitch. Oh, this is, is an it? embroidery. Embroidery. I'm so sorry. The bag wasn't included in it wasn't. last. No, in last year's stitch to you, we just did this lovely embroidery. But a bag was included in this year's yeah, Stitcher You. Yeah, the bag was included. The bag making was included in this year's Stitcher You. And loads of people are just finishing their bags, incorporating their cross stitch into it. And it's just been brilliant. But this one, I, I just made into a bag last year. And you know, this is one of my most favourite bags. Along with the Moo and Mouse, I know that <laughs> I said that was my favourite. But I do love this bag and it matches the socks. So again, I've finished a whole sock of this and I've started the second and I have shown these before a couple of episodes ago, I think, but I've finished a sock now and I just am in love with these socks. So these socks I created because when I designed the fairground socks, which is a recently released pattern, I thought it would be fun to work out a modification that would work with a tonal sort of plain yarn because the fairground socks have got movement in them it's got that wave pattern going on so that's why they work so well with self striping because it emphasizes the stripes but I wanted a way of showing that off showing the movement off but being able to use a different yarn so I've modified the pattern and I knit these I'm knitting these socks I've finished the first one and my goodness they're so pretty so let me show you the first sock, but they're just so lovely. Look how pretty these have come out. So this is my fairground pattern, but modified quite heavily so that you can see the movement, you can see that wave running through the sock. And when I came up with this, I didn't think I would do anything with the design as such because I was just doing it to see if I could do it because I just think it's so pretty and I'm so pleased with it. It seems a shame really not to do something with it. And I think what I might do is release this as another pattern, another paid for pattern, but because it's a modification of the fairground socks, when I first release it, I think what I will do is I will discount the pattern for maybe a month or maybe two months when the pattern first comes out so that it's half price. So that if, for example, you've already purchased the fairground socks, you can then go and purchase this and it's only going to cost you half a normal pattern. Likewise, it may be that you've not purchased the fairground socks at all. You can purchase them both and you'll get one at full price, one at half price, or you'd just get a bargain if you just wanted to buy this one. You could just buy this one and you'd just get a bargain for that first maybe month. And then that gives everybody the opportunity who has either A, bought the fairground socks already or wants to, to buy them at that point, you will get this one for half price. So I think that kind of makes sense in my head and it means that it's a good way of getting the pattern out there because it is just so pretty, it's so lovely. And this yarn is the uh, Malabrigo Ultimate Sock in the Ravelry Red colourway and it's lovely. The yarn, you know, the yarn is lovely. I've knit with this yarn before, the base is really nice. The yarn itself, it, you know, the colour is lovely. It's quite, the colour is, again, it's not a flat colour as, as what we've been talking about. There's lots of tones. I hope you can see that through the yarn. So it's really, really pretty. And I've got the second one on the needles. I'm knitting these with double points because I wanted to knit this pattern using a different method because the, my fairground socks I knitted using Magic Loop and I made three, four pairs of those with Magic Loop and I wanted to see what it felt like knitting it with double points to see what the experience was like for knitters that use double points and it's a joy, it's an absolute joy, you know, I've loved it and I'm heavily back into the double points I think as you've probably guessed. So I've got the second one on the go, I've knit the rib and I've just done one repeat and I'm using chow goos for this which are lovely. I do like Chowgu metal needles because they're nice and pointy without being deathly pointy. <laughs> so they're really, really nice metal needles. 
so yeah I'm going to carry on working through these really it's such a such a pleasant pattern to knit if you've knit the fairground socks hopefully you would agree with me that it's really lovely to knit knits up super quick and this modification has got all the same elements for me you know you can memorize the there's more rows to it but you can memorize it really easy really easily and it's just equally as as much of a joy so watch the space for that really and i'll keep you posted and the reason why Kay's been talking lots about the old DPNs is because she's been oh. honing her DPN skills yes. ready for our Soccer Ween event yes. coming from the 1st of October to the 31st of October, where we're going to be refreshing our absolutely ancient yep. DPN Sock Tutorial, Beginner we Sock are. Tutorial yes. series. And you're going to be, it's a special pattern yes. for DPNs. Yeah, I've designed a, it's just a shorty, a vanilla shorty pattern so you, you'll get the full pdf pattern and then the series will go along with it and i'll just walk you through every step of knitting a pair of socks using double pointed needles and that's coming in october it's our yes. next special patron yeah. event but now oh my goodness it's time for us to introduce our first ever two-parter get a cup of tea get a cup of tea yes. settle in because in the first part we are going to really sort of delve into the foundations of Fountains Abbey. Just the most epic destination possible. Through this series, we've been going to lots of places where we've had to use our imaginations to think about buildings that were once there and perhaps we could only just see the shape of in the ground. Here, it's pretty much all there. Yeah. So my goodness, there's a lot to see. So without further ado, I should shut up and you should join me as we begin our journey into the story of Fountains Abbey. Fifteen hundred years ago, a way of life arrived in Europe that shaped the development of the world we live in today. Healthcare and education are just two of the many innovations pioneered by the men and women of the monasteries. From the height of their powers at the time of the Normans to their total destruction at the hands of a tyrant king and a cruel emperor. This is one of the most epic stories the world has got to tell and whilst their way of life may have virtually disappeared Everywhere you look across Europe, you'll find ruined monasteries, echoes of their fascinating existence. And in this series, I'm gonna take you to some of my absolute favorites. This is gonna be quite an adventure. Welcome to the rise and fall of the monasteries. Welcome back, everyone. 
everyone to the rise and fall of the monasteries. We are at the start of a rather exciting two episode odyssey and I couldn't be more thrilled about this because we've traveled 28 miles south of Mount Grace Priory and we are on the southeast edge of the Yorkshire Dales National Park. We're just actually no distance at all from a place where I called home actually in the 2000s. And prior to that, I used to come here regularly. It is of course the city of Ripon, home to one of my favorite cathedrals. When I was a choir boy, I would come here to sing. And it just feels like home being back here. So I'm very excited that we're really gonna sink our teeth into probably the most exciting bits of history that we've covered in all of this series. Neil, we're not far at all, speaking of history, from Brimham Rocks. And today that's one of the most popular tourist attractions in this area. Hundreds of thousands of years ago it was formed. And when man first sort of set foot around here, people had no idea how the amazing rocks that are there had been formed. But thanks to modern science, today we know exactly what it is and people flock to it in their thousands. The presence of Brimham Rocks made this a hotbed for prehistoric action and all over this place you'll find stone circles and lots of historians actually believe that it's sites like Brimham Rocks that inspired the, bril the, the, the building of stone circles in the first place. Now when Julius Caesar arrived in England in 55 BC, he gave the men who worshipped, who really led the worship in the stone circles, a name and they were called the Druids. And to this day, an awful lot of the stone formations that you'll find at Brimham Rocks have names that refer to the Druids, like this one. This is known as the Druids writing desk. Fast forward to episode one of this series, where do you remember St Hilda at Hartlepool when Christianity first came to England? Well, one of the sites that was chosen to build a monastery, they weren't called monasteries then, as we've discovered in this series, they're actually called minsters. The first, well, one of the first places to be chosen to build a minster after the Synod of Whitby was actually Ripon, just up the road. The presence of that minster attracted holy men and women for miles around and this place became a real hotbed for religion as a whole. The Archbishop of York himself built a, a, a home not far at all from that minster known as the Archbishop's Palace. It wasn't quite that grand but that's what it was called back then. And it's actually the, the presence of that palace, that's actually the, one of the reasons why we're here at all, because if that palace hadn't been there, then the land that was settled as Fountains Abbey would not have been settled because it was owned by the Archbishop himself. We will get on to all of this within the story because what are we gonna cover in these two episodes? Well, in this first episode, we're gonna uncover the fascinating story of the foundation of Fountains Abbey. And in the second episode, we're gonna really dig into the amazing things that we're going to be able to see here because that's what makes fountains so special there is so much left to explore now i mentioned that the archbishop and his palace is the reason why fountains is, is here and that's not actually completely true because for us to get to the start of our story we need to return to where this series started and that's my hometown of york The year was 1132 AD and nestled on the banks of the River Ouse in the city of York lay St Mary's Abbey. 
It had been formed 44 years before as a Benedictine house, so they followed the rule of St. Benedict to the letter. But there was a problem. By this time, the Order of the Benedictines had been in existence for 603 years, and certain liberties had been taken with the strictness of their way of life. The situation came to a head when Revo Abbey was founded by the Cistercians. The Cistercians were the new kids on the block, having only been founded in 1093 AD. Whilst they too followed the rule of St. Benedict, they had developed a reputation for sanctity, poverty and simplicity which appealed to the most devout monks. And so a problem arose here at St. Mary's Abbey in York in April 1132. Six members of the community, led by a senior monk called Richard, began to press their abbot for a return to their original sound Benedictine values. The abbot of St. Mary's did not respond well. He took great offence to his authority being questioned and refused to listen to any of their concerns. This lit a tinderbox which exploded violently. Dissent spread across the community and two factions formed. Seven more monks joined the dissenters, including St. Mary's second in command, Prior Richard. We're walking across all that's left of St. Mary's cloister, and on the 6th of October, Archbishop Thurston of York arrived here to settle the dispute. But a brawl broke out between the two sides. Thurston did the only thing he thought he could and took the 13 dissenters into his personal care, and he brought them to his home in Ripon to plan their next move. And so we are off on our epic quest to discover the story of Fountains Abbey. And it's really apt that we're starting here in Skelbank Wood. It's really wild and decidedly Jurassic Park-esque <laughs> with all the birds appearing from the foliage either side of me. And the wildness, it was perfect. It was the ideal spot because the most senior monk in the Cistercian order at that time had a very specific idea about where monasteries should be set up. Wise words that resonate so loudly today, given the proliferation of technology vying for our attention. Bernard would go on to become one of the most important religious men of his time. And he actually co-founded an order which you'll probably have heard of, and, and that's the Knights Templar. But back in 1132, on the 27th of December, 13 men arrived here with Archbishop Thurston to set up what they hoped would become a Cistercian monastery. Acceptance would not be easy though. Walking through this wood today is difficult to imagine. The challenge that faced these 13 men as they took their first tentative steps into what was a whole new world. There were no roads nearby, so there was no builders or carpenters who could be brought in. They were gonna to have to, by hand, remove all the trees which lined the banks of the Skell to create the space to construct their very first monastic buildings. And they were gonna to have to do it themselves and by hand. If you wanted to be a Cistercian, you were gonna to have to work for it. In 
In the spring of 1133, the community had constructed a second wattle building, which they used as a chapel. And they'd also created a very simple garden to provide them with the very basics of food. It was from these very humble beginnings that they sent emissaries to Bernard in Clairvaux itself to ask for acceptance into the Cistercian order. This was very much the moment of truth and it could have gone either way because they were coming into the Cistercian order in a very unconventional fashion. Just, I can't really sort of imagine how nervous the men must have been who stayed behind waiting for news. Would they be accepted? Would all their hard work have been worth it? By Christmas 1133, the first buildings had been constructed in wood. The first really sort of proper buildings that felt like a home, if you like. And one of the monks who was living here at the time was a man called Serlo. And he said through all of this, through all the trials, that the men of Rivo had been a constant inspiration. He said that they spoke with the tongues of angels, but they were here on earth. I think that's such a great phrase. You'd like to think, wouldn't you, that as these first wooden buildings went up, that the challenging times were over. But unfortunately they weren't because as those first buildings were being completed, the crop failed. The crop was completely ruined and they began to starve. They actually survived on a, 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 a a sort of soup made from elm leaves and also field herbs. Word though of their tenacity spread and the marshal of a nearby castle sent loads of bread. Permission was granted. After all the hard work, everything it seemed was gonna to come to an end. But there was a, a savior on the horizon because Archbishop Thurston of York had a plan to save Fountains Abbey. Three of his most senior priests at York Minster were due to retire and one of them was the Dean. Now all three brought with them quite a lot of money, but the Dean brought with him a huge collection of religious books. Now, he sat them all down and persuaded them that Fountains would be a great place to retire to. And amazingly, they all agreed. Fountains' future was secured because each of them donated their wealth to Fountains and the Dean also donated his library. Within a short time now, really within months, 35 monks were here on the banks of the River Skell, worshipping in a very simple monastery and in a very sort of rudimentary wooden church. The moment had come to start building in stone. Now there's something quite unique about the buildings of Fountains Abbey because they were all constructed on pretty much exactly the same footprint. That's really rare in the building of monasteries. Normally, the first buildings would be on one side of a field and then the next buildings would be on the other side of the field. And then when they decided to then upgrade again, they would then do it on the opposite side. And the reason why they did it that way was so that services could always continue. That wasn't the case here at Fountains. It must have been a nightmare as the builders were working and you were trying to pray in your nine services a day. Clearly the monks felt there was something very special about that original site that they chose when they first came here to the banks of the River Skell. And I've got to say, I agree with them. Let's see what you think. Let's go and explore the buildings of Fountains Abbey.
welcome everyone to the cloister here at Fountains Abbey and it is just spectacular isn't it? Now of all the abbeys that we've visited in this series this is the one that I know best because I've been here so many times. And through this series, I think it's fair to say that quite often we've had to use our imaginations to picture buildings that were once there that have long since gone. At Fountains, things are just a little bit different. Come on, I'll show you some of the things that we're gonna be exploring over the next two episodes. Just off the southern side of the cloister, we find the kitchen. Do you remember the one we saw at Revo? It was barely a shell and about half this size. Here we find everything other than the man in charge of this space, which was the cellarer himself. As we pan around the kitchen, we see some of the cupboards there in the wall that would have been used to keep utensils, or maybe even certain foodstuffs. And at the back there, I think that's a bread oven. And there is the door through to the refectory where food was served. As we leave the kitchen behind, we're gonna walk past the absolutely vast refectory. Now, fear not, we'll get into there in the next episode here from Fountains Abbey, because up here, is something I've not seen anywhere, actually. Any site we've been to this series or anywhere else I recall to ever visiting. Because right here, we've got the stairs to the monk's dormitory and it's the day stairs. In this series, we've only seen the night stairs and we can walk up them. These were the stairs used by the monks every night as they made their way up to bed they would get to the top and turn left into the dormitory. We though, rather wonderfully, can turn right into a fully roofed internal room. Welcome everyone to the Moneyment Room. Now, Moneyment is actually a legal term for an important document, normally of land ownership. And this was actually the warmest and driest room in all the Abbey because the warming room with its great fireplace that we'll see next episode was right below me. Now, over the course of these two episodes, we're gonna discover how Fountains Abbey became probably the richest abbey in all of England. So this room would have been absolutely stuffed full of documents of importance. Those were just two tiny fragments of all that's to come over the next two episodes as we discover the story of Fountains Abbey. Now, to do that, we're gonna to need to take a walk through history and peel back the layers of this fascinating building until we find that very first wooden church where Abbot Richard and his bustling community of just 12 monks would come and pray every day. Before any of these spectacular stone buildings were constructed, a wooden church sat right here on the banks of the River Skell. We know this because in 1979, archeological work was done and the very first post holes ever to be sunk on this site were found. Those post holes were for the first wooden church and they were discovered in the south transept of this church, which is just up here. In 
It was under this floor that those post holes were found. Measurements were taken and the uniform nature of the holes, combined with their exact distance apart, told archaeologists that whilst these buildings were simple, the carpentry skills on show were superb. With the arrival of the three monks from York Minster, Fountains Abbey's future was now secure and men flocked to their cause from all across Yorkshire. It created a problem because Fountains Abbey was just not big enough for them. There was now 35 monks living here and so two changes were made. The first was a stone church was built right behind me. It's not that one we can see, that comes later in the story which we'll get to. And the second was Fountains became a missionary church, much, much like Revo Abbey. So when 12 new monks had been trained up in the ways of the Cistercians, they set out from their mother house here at Fountains Abbey to anywhere in Europe to set up new monastic houses. In just seven years, Richard, the first abbot of Fountains, had taken his band of merry men from the woods of Skelbank to a monastic house destined for greatness. And now men he had trained were taking the lessons he taught them all over Europe. In his final years, he watched on as the first stone church at Fountains Abbey was completed. When that first stone church was built, it was exactly on this footprint. A little bit smaller than the current church that's here now, but it would have stood right here. This would have been the nave. Now, it was a simple structure, but very striking. And it was built very much in the traditions of Bernard of Clairvaux. He had himself criticized the churches of the day, specifically the Benedictines, saying that their immense height, superfluous breadth, and costly furnishings may attract the eye of the worshipper, but they most certainly hindered their attention. Archaeological work undertaken here has revealed that the first church was plastered inside and out and overpainted with a masonry pattern. It had an earthen floor strewn with rushes and most probably a thatched roof. The walls and windows were simple with little or no decoration. It was far from what we see here today and Abbot Richard must have been thrilled with it, fitting so perfectly with the austere approach favoured by the Cistercians. The first abbot of Fountains Abbey died in 1139, some seven years after he'd led his band of dissenters from St Mary's Abbey in York. And what an adventure he'd had. We can't be completely certain how old Richard was when he died, but what we do know is he was probably in his mid-50s, as he'd risen through the ranks already at St Mary's, and when he left St Mary's to come here, he was already prior. What we do know though is that he's buried somewhere here, in the traditional place that Cistercians like to bury their dead, beneath their great east window. As we discovered at Jervo Abbey, Cistercians did not believe in graveyards with headstones. Instead, they laid their brothers to rest as close as they could to the Abbey Church, beneath their great east window, always the site of wonderful stained glass windows, and they surrounded it with trees. Instead of a place of death, this was a site of light and life. So what would happen to Fountains Abbey now? Who would lead them into a future that would see them becoming the most successful Cistercian Abbey in all of Europe? Only the man who had led the first dissenters way back in 1132. And when I see you in part two, we'll be discovering his story. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you later on in the show with more Rise and Fall of the Monasteries. Wow.
what a story. Oh my goodness, and what a place. Do you know what? I was nervous. <laughs> You're always nervous. No, no, no. No, 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 no. This was proper. Because we used to live near there. We did. Because I used to go there only on special occasions because it was so expensive when I was young. Oh, when you were young, right. Now, because of English heritage, we just walk in. Yeah, we're members of English heritage. We have been. It's a bargain. Yeah, and we, you know, that that's, I think that's the reason, because we lived so close, we lived like two miles away for a couple of years. We used to go all the time, yeah. didn't we? Yeah. Um, when Bryony was really tiny. Yeah. And, you know, it could go for a lovely walk and it didn't cost anything effectively, you know, because you'd got membership. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and also as well, I think the great thing about English Heritage membership is y- you are helping keep... Yeah. Amazing places. Yeah. yeah. For future generations. That's right. And so it's worth it. Yeah, I mean if you you are someone who visits a lot of these places like we you know, we do and we have over the years, then you save yourself a lot of money over the course of a year. The the way we were operating, and to an extent I think it, it pays for itself now with us. Yeah. But the way we were the way we were operating, the way we were operating <laughs> It paid for itself in three months. Yeah. That's how often we were going. Yeah, yeah. I mean, just tremendous. Yeah. But what a start. Oh, my goodness. Do you know what? Walking through Skelbank Wood, mm. it really gave a feel of what it must have been like for those first monks yeah. as they arrived there yeah. to set up that monastery and to think, you know, just in caves. And what's funny mm. is, you will have noticed, I'm sure, when we've been there, every so often you'll see a sort of cave-like thing mm, along there. Mm. Now, the reason for that is that's because they took the stone out mm. from the caves to they build used the it abbey. as a quarry. Mm. But I find that strangely sort of poetic mm, mm. in that, you know, where they started, they've then used that mm. to then build the place, you know, and which I, I as, When I was watching it, it was a lot of it was new to me because I'd never been in that wood where, where Dan started out when no. he was walking. I've, I'd never been there and I was like, gosh, I was trying to place it within the... Yeah. the landscape because we know fountains so well i was like gosh whereabouts is that and then once i saw the drone footage i realized yeah. just where it was yeah so useful it's, yeah the drone footage yeah. helps you really sort of place things in the landscape mm. which is just you know it's tremendous but that's just the start when we come back for part two we're going to learn who is going to replace yeah. the amazing richard who you know brought all those amazing men from St Mary's to Scalbank to build yeah. Fountains Abbey. Who will replace him? You'll find out later on in the show. Right now, it's time for me to ask Kay Jones, what's off your needles? Well, I have three lovely things. It feels Let's... different actually saying Kay Jones, what's off your needles, because normally it's you saying, Dan Jones, what's off your needles? Is that is that the case? Well, it was last episode. You said normally. That is not normally the case. Yeah, I'm hoping new viewers might think that I'm this prolific knitter who's always casting stuff off. (laughs) It's not true. It's hilarious, isn't he? (laughs) So, yes, I do have three things. And the first thing I'll talk about is my next upcoming design. So this is the... This is the what's-his-name cowl. What's-his-name because I just, I, I loved it. I've been saving this this name as part of this collection because this cowl, you've seen this cowl before, but not off the needles. I think I have showed it to you when I was knitting it, but this is now the finished cowl. And this is part of a, a three, a tri, I can't think of the word. Partide agreement. <laughs> <laughs> It is your collection within a collection. Yes, where um, I've designed three things based around the Magic Faraway Tree book by Enid Blyton. I'm so excited by this design because it like it just pulls it. Oh, yeah. So I've, what, it's amazing. So the first design was the Magic Faraway mitts. The second was the Land of Spells hat. And the third is the What's His Name cowl. Now, Mr. What's His Name is a character in the Magic Faraway Tree, but he also comes into other stories as well. And he actually lives in the tree with a bunch of other people. And he does have a name, 
but he can't remember what his name is because it's so long. So he just calls himself Mr. What's His Name. <laughs> and when you get the pattern, the little write-up on the front of it, I do put in what his name actually is. And it's about this long and unpronounceable. It's really funny. He's a really funny character. So I knew when I designed this that I was going to call it the What's His Name Cow. So the, the cowl actually is... It's not just a random design, it is inspired by the tree itself and the faraway, the magic faraway tree has windows in it. Where, you know, all the people that live there, there are little houses in there and it, there's windows. So this design is meant to reflect the windows, so the lace pattern look like the little square windows in the tree. And then I've used the five minis that I've used all the way through these three designs. So the yarns have stayed the same through the three designs and that's how they've been linked. So these are the five minis that I've, you know, I've inserted these panels in, which just kind of reflect the colors and the texture of the tree itself. So it's entirely sort of motivated by the tree and the story of the people that live in the tree. So this is the What's His Name Cowl and it'll be going out as my next platinum design on the 1st of September, which is not very long at all. And it's the final one of the year. And it's year. the final one of the year. Of the 2023 uh, season. Yeah, because the next platinum pattern is, of course, the advent calendar design. <laughs> Stop everything. Yes, we've mentioned the advent calendar. It's not even September yet. But of course, we have to work way in advance. So the design has been designed and I am working through the sort of sample, if you like now. So all is good and in hand and it's very exciting. It's, I love, love, love the theme this year. We'll not talk about the advent calendar now, not shall yet. we? No, not yet. Not, not yet. yet. No. But fear not, the mystery knit along will begin. Yes. On the 1st of December. 1st of December. Yes. So but, my, but this, this, you know, it's lovely, and it's this complete case first yes. ever collection within with, the platinum seat. Yes, yeah, but yeah. you've never designed three items that go no. together before, no. and my goodness, do That's these right. go together so yeah. subtly? I, this is, I think these might be your. First, I love them. Yeah, <laughs> and this this cowl is knit with yarn held double as well, so it knits up really quick. So yeah, and it's super snuggly and warm and you'll, you'll have a full set of items ready for the autumn. Beautiful. What else is off your needles? So the next thing is a pair of socks for Dan. Oh, at last. Yay! I finished these socks that I was knitting for him. Do you remember these ones? Thank you very much. So these are knitted using, it's Malabrigo Ultimate Sock again. And this is Indicita is the colourway. It's sort of blues and greens and purples really pretty and I put in this knit pearl texture pattern which I really loved and I put this into the last episode of Knitability that went out. Edition even. Oh, what did I say? Episode. The last edition of Knitability that went out. <laughs> it's your salty air socks. Salty air socks. Beautiful. I couldn't remember the name last time could I? But yeah these are the salty air socks. So all finished for Dan. You can see how long Dan's foot is. So they do take me a while. And these socks, they do have my umbrella toe, but I came up with a modified version for Dan because his feet are so weird. I have elongated the toe, so you can the toe starts sort of down here. So it's much longer. It's instead of being sort of just short of two inches, this toe is closer to three inches. So it's just my modified umbrella toe that works really well for you. I've done a few pairs with this Perfect. now. So they're for you and you can have them now. Thank you very much. There you go. Wonderful. All for you. What else is off your needles? Goodness, the last thing is another pair of socks and these are beautiful. It's my scrappy fairground socks. Do you remember these? They're gorgeous. And these are all finished now. So yeah, I knit these using little scraps of yarn and I used 24 different colours. So these are like a little advent fairground socks. So it's like fairground socks for sort of, oh, I've lost. This is called talking. We make words with our mouth. Make of that what you will. Yes, yes, yes. These are finished. Yes. <laughs> My favourite yarn out of all of them, I think, is this one that I mentioned to you before. Can you see this lovely yarn here? 
and I think it's the Sherry Iris. It's so pretty. I absolutely love it. SI.com. Yeah. But uh, the what, sorry? SI.com. Yeah, she changed. You see, unfortunately, SI will always be sports illustrated. Yeah, I know. Sherry changed her logo, didn't she, fairly recently? And I mentioned it to Dan that she changed all of her logo, and he looked at it and he went, That's Sports Illustrated, isn't it? (laughs) Sorry, Sherry. <laughs> but it, as somebody who reads that, you know, that's yes. just what popped into his head. Yes. But yeah, these are all done and beautiful. And I think I'm going to pop these away maybe for Christmas for Bryony because they're a much, they're a really long leg, quite a long leg for, for me. Um, I'm not sure how many rounds it was, but because it's a longer leg, I think I'll save them for Christmas so that she can wear them in the winter with her boots. Beautiful. What a wonderful collection of What's Off Your Needles. And I could not be more excited about th- that platinum design. And it's... You could wear that. I know it's lace, well, but you could wear that. I cannot wait to see you in all three going out for your walk. I will. When it's I wear all three, as soon as the weather turns, I will definitely wear them all and I'll take some photos. Amazing. Amazing. Yeah. Right now, though, it's time for us to return to the gorgeous Fountains Abbey yes. and for us to find out who took over from Abbot Richard. You'll be very pleased to hear it was, in fact, Abbot Richard. everyone to the rise and fall of the monasteries. We're exploring the wonderful Fintons Abbey on the very outskirts of the Yorkshire Dales. Now when you left me, Fountain's first abbot, the wonderful Richard, had died, but he's taken the community of Fountain's Abbey to great heights. But who are they now going to choose to replace him? Well, you could argue that the man they chose was the man who inspired all of this. Because for the seven years that the Fountains had been in existence since its formation in 1132, a man, again called Richard, was serving as its prior. And Richard had previously been the sacrist at St Mary's Abbey. And Richard was the man who was initially inspired by the Cistercians of Revo, who stirred up five of his brothers and who began what ended up as that riot that we learnt about earlier on in the show. Now he potentially was the perfect man to lead the men of Fountains Abbey to new heights. Abbot Richard II could not have been more different to his predecessor. He was exceptionally humble and felt unworthy of his newfound position. Plans had been in place to continue the building of the abbey in stone, but Richard was not the type of man to lead a dynamic building programme, so expansion stopped and fountains consolidated its position. This was clearly a moment with a changing of the guard taking place because not long after Richard himself died, But Fountain's greatest supporter, Archbishop Thurston, also died. And the new abbot, Abbot Richard, confusingly, (laughs) Abbot Richard II, decided to embroil himself in ensuring, given the fact that the Archbishop's palace is so close, he wanted to make sure that the right man was in charge so that Fountain's growth could continue and they could become what everyone dreamt that they would be perhaps the most successful abbey in all of England. Now, sadly, fate was not on Abbot Richard II's side because the man chosen was someone called William Fitzherbert, and he was an active critic of the Cistercians. And so Richard decided, Abbot Richard II decided, that he was going to ensure that he was not confirmed as Archbishop and that a new man should be chosen. And there was only one way that Abbot Richard could do this, and that's by going on a mission to Rome itself. (laughs) 
so Abbot Richard II travelled to Rome, a perilous journey especially for an older man in the Middle Ages. He petitioned the Pope to withhold the appointment of the new Archbishop Fitzherbert, to which the Pope agreed. It probably helped that the Pope at the time had himself been a Cistercian monk. It was still a remarkable achievement. Overjoyed but exhausted, Abbot Richard II stopped off in France on his way home to seek counsel with Bernard of Clairvaux, which he was very happy to give. But whilst he was there, Abbot Richard II died. Bernard was so moved by the story and so keen to get a positive resolution for his brothers at Fountains that he sent his right-hand man to continue Abbot Richard II's inspiring work. His name was Henry Murdoch, and he was perfect for the job. Whilst he had been trained in France under Bernard of Clairvaux himself, he was actually from York. He'd grown up in Yorkshire itself, and he was absolutely passionate about his home county. Now, he, as I've said, had been trained on the continent, so he was bang up to date with all the current ways of the Cistercians. And the best part about Henry was that he'd actually already risen to the rank of abbot of uh, an abbey in France called Vauclair. Now, Henry, by trade, he was actually a builder, and he designed and project managed the building of his own abbey in Vauclair. Now, when the, the, this job here at Fountains Abbey came up, he jumped at the chance. He thought it was the perfect opportunity to get back to his homeland, doing the job that he loved. And they really couldn't have picked a more perfect man to complete the building of Fountains Abbey in stone. The history books tell us Henry was appalled by what he saw when he arrived. Fountains had no cloister and no lay brothers. Following the death of their first abbot, their growth had simply stopped. Abbot Henry set about his new task with relish. When he arrived here in 1144 AD, none of what you see below existed, but in just three years, huge parts of it were built. The first thing that Abbot Henry did was change the course of the River Skell. It once had run much closer to the Abbey buildings and now he knew that he had to move it to give him space to do all that was to follow. This must have seemed like quite the innovation for the monks of Fountains Abbey. Whilst changing where water was, was you know, a very common Cistercian innovation, it was clear that the men of Fountains Abbey were really a bit of a backwater at this time. Abbot Henry knew he needed more space to build all the amenities the monastery needed to work efficiently. So he channeled the main course of the river, which used to run straight forward here. Instead, he put a sharp dogleg to the right and sent it off up there. Henry knew though, like all good Cistercians, that he still needed fresh water to flush away any waste and also to provide them with clean water to drink. So he kept a canal of flowing fresh water on the original course of the river. This though was just the start of his building innovations. Next on his list of improvements was the Great West Range. Now we've seen shells of these buildings at Revo and at Gervo, but here it's complete with columns and we even have a roof. Whilst braziers would have hung from the roof to give some light, you get a much better feeling of how dark life must have been in the Middle Ages. As you may remember, this space was split into three sections. The first we've just walked through was the place where visitors were greeted. This central space was the Lay Brothers staff room where they could wind down at the end of a long day. And here at the end was the Lay Brothers refectory where the men who worked the fields of the abbey had their meals.
Now, this space was actually right next to the kitchen, which we saw earlier on in the episode. So it was really easy for the lay brothers who were serving the other lay brothers who were sat here in their refectory to very quickly get backwards and forwards to keep that food piping hot. Now, this has been extended a little bit. It was extended in some later building that we're gonna get onto a little bit this episode and loads more next episode. But the majority of this space, the majority of what we've just walked through was originally constructed by Henry Murdoch. And actually, Henry's construction techniques are really easy to spot all over the abbey because of the size of the bricks. I'll show you, actually. It's really interesting when you see in a wall. Come on, let's go take a look. As we leave the West Range behind, Henry had now constructed the elements to his great monastery that would provide for the labour of the community. And we're making our way across the cloister, en route to the next point of Henry's work, which was the area where the monks themselves would live and sleep and work, in fact. So he constructed them an east range with a dormitory and a warming room and it's here that we'll see clearly evidence of his stonework. Do you see the rough looking blocks? They're simply cut pieces of grit stone and they have wide mortar joints. They are reflective of the simple way the first Cistercian churches were built. This is Abbot Henry's work. It differs greatly from the work that we see just above, which was undertaken in the years following Henry's first works here at Fountains Abbey. We'll cover the story of these buildings in our second episode. Henry also constructed the first cloister, and this doorway is all that remains of it. We can tell it's Henry's work because do you see how the inner door is smaller than the outer door? It's also not quite aligned. You can just make out the carvings in the stonework too. Just spectacular. But there was a bit of a problem because Abbot Henry was a little bit of a religious firebrand and he threw himself into the fight to make sure the right Archbishop of York was appointed with so much zeal that it really started to upset the supporters of Archbishop Fitzwilliam, who was still not confirmed by Rome. The situation got so bad that in 1146, the supporters of Archbishop Fitzwilliam marched on Finton's Abbey and tried to burn it down. The finishing touches were just being put to Henry's enlarged stone church as the attack took place. And as the building was engulfed with flames, you can only imagine how he and his community of monks felt. Archaeological work done in the 1980s uncovered intense burning and molten glass. The community must have thought all was lost. Astonishingly, thanks to Abbot Henry's advanced building techniques, the majority of Fountains Abbey was saved. It was severely damaged, but it was nowhere near as bad as they'd expected as they watched the building burn. Archbishop Fitzherbert was taking on a religious zealot, a, an enemy that he could never have bargained for. And now, Abbot Henry was gonna win at all costs, and so he called in favors from all across Europe and conveniently found evidence that Archbishop Fitzherbert had bribed his way into the role of Archbishop of York. And so he was immediately removed from office. The problem was that York Minster still needed an Archbishop. Now, who do you think was appointed to the role? Yes, you guessed it. It was Henry Murdoch himself. It all feels a little bit fishy, doesn't it? And personally, I think it was. But the fact remains that Abbot Henry had morals that were completely rooted in the Cistercian order and the rule of St. Benedict. And it cannot be argued that what he achieved in the buildings here at Fountains Abbey in just three years was an absolutely miraculous achievement. And it wasn't just here that Fountain's influence was taking hold. By 1150 AD, as Abbot Henry resigned from his role to begin his new job as Archbishop of York, eight new monastic houses had been formed from its community. To give you a comparison, 
Revo Abbey formed just two new houses in the same time period. Many historians believe that Fountain's greatest achievement was the foundation of the first Cistercian Abbey in Norway. It was in 1147 when 12 men set off from here to a place in Norway that's now known as Lisa Abbey. They trained here under Henry, they lived through the fire and then branched out with a new life in a whole new country where there was no other Cistercians. I mean, it must have been the most spectacular of adventures. And those same historians actually believe that had it not been for the fire, th th that abbey would never have been founded. And the reason for that is when the fire happened, it dramatically reduced the capacity of monks that fountains could actually house. 35 men lived here at the time and they had to move some on. So without the tragedy of the fire, perhaps Lee's Abbey would never have been formed. Every cloud does indeed have a silver lining. But what of fountains? Who would fill the shoes of Henry Murdoch? choice. The new man in charge here at Fountains Abbey had once again been trained by Bernard himself in Clairvaux. He was a Yorkshireman and you'd be very pleased to know that he was also called Richard. The very special thing about Abbot Richard III was that he took the framework that Henry had developed at Fountains Abbey and my goodness did he embellish it because when he'd finished he created one of the most spectacular monastic buildings in all of England. See you next time, we'll uncover exactly how he did it. We'll also get our head into all the amazing sights that there are in this spectacular place. You've really got to see them to believe them. We'll also actually uncover the story of how a monastic order that belie believed in simplicity and definitely not beautiful carvings and spectacular buildings could ever have constructed a church quite like this. It's a story which will bring us to the eve of the downfall of the monasteries. And I can't wait to share it with you. I'll see you next time for more Rise and Fall of the Monasteries. an episode what a start oh lovely what a start to our exploration mm. of fountains abbey and how exciting to find out that the the man who would lead them into their future which we'll be exploring in the second part of our fountains abbey extravaganza was also called abbot richard <laughs> it's very convenient of them to do that isn't it what a popular name well, it must have just been really popular at the time. I need to look at the history. Richard was a really popular name when I was 
growing up. Like, there was loads of rich... <laughs> You're not that old, darling. No, but do you know, it must have been... When was I born? 71. So it yeah. must it must have been a popular name around that time to yeah. name their kids because there was loads of Richards at school. Yes, definitely. Yeah. So yes, next time, 22nd of September, we will be back at Fountains Abbey and we will be exploring it at its height. Yeah. And what's so exciting about this episode is, and the reason why I was so desperate to do this this way, what we'll see at Fountains very much is a microcosm of every other abbey that we've been to. So the story that we'll cover at Fountains, it pretty much was the same in every single one of them as they get to the point where it starts to tip over the edge and become over the top, ostentatious, and perhaps not what men like Abbot Richard I and Henry Murdoch and Allred of Revo had envisaged when the monasteries had first formed. It's a really fascinating mm. story. And 22nd of September, I'll be sharing it with you. If you're anywhere near Fountains Abbey, you know, and you've never been, it's really, really worth a visit. You know, you can... We've been so many times and sometimes we've just taken a picnic or we've just had a stroll and a picnic. Other times we've had a really good walk. You can walk quite a long way oh, at yeah. Fountain Sabby. You really can. You know, if you go all the way round, there's a really there's a really high portion of it and then the abbey itself is down in the valley. And then you could come and out and you can pick up the walk at the yeah. far side of the lake and that is like three or four miles. Yeah. You yeah. could walk eight miles. You, no you could, but you know, you could easily we've quite often walked like um, two and a half miles and you get a really steep bit so if you do like an incline I like an incline when I'm walking because it's you know it's really good to get your heart pumping a little bit faster and it's great for your legs as well to walk inclines and there's a really steep one at fountains so yeah definitely a great place for a day out so we're back with more rise and fall of the monasteries on the 22nd of September that means next time, Kay's back with more decreases, yes. baby. Yes, indeed. Oh, yes, we're racing towards the finish line. It's very exciting. I was like a, a demon in the dying kitchen yesterday. Although she did get a little bit stressed. I did get a little bit stressed. Because oh, no. she I, wanted to be perfect. I, yeah, because I, I was trialling all three colours, the last three colours. I just wanted to get them all straight in my head because I've just got such a lot going on at the moment. You know, we're in a really busy time. I I wanted to just get the last three colours sorted and you know they need a bit of tweaking but I, I mean I did it but I, I did get a bit kind of overwrought because it, it took me a good few hours and it was hot in there and fear not though yeah. she did a wonderful <laughs> job and she'll be revealing to you the first of those final yes. three colours when we see you for our next episode of the video yeah. show yeah. right now though it's time for the endy bits endy bits so yes our next knit along yes yes so we've got a self-striping in knit september. along <laughs> self-striping september beautiful that's what it is so yes you, hashtag that's what it is perfect so the idea is that for the month of september you knit something with self-striping yarn now inevitably it will probably be socks for most people but it doesn't have to be you know if you want to knit something else with self-striping then go for it like a blanket well, I guess you could if it was leftovers. Or a throw. We can do anything you want if you wanted to. You're being silly now, aren't you? You're no. being silly. No. I think he's being silly. I'm not. It? it wouldn't show up so much, would it, if in, in a blanket? You wouldn't see the self strike. You see, now I'm thinking about it. It's just winding me up. So I'm going to knit some socks, but you can knit whatever you want. But basically, you've got to use a self striping yarn. Whips are included. So if you started something already, you want to get it finished up in September, then absolutely you can enter it. So I will open up a thread on Ravelry within the next few days and get that open and ready. Now the thread will be used for chatter and for posting your photos because this is a very casual, very relaxed knit along. So what I will do for prizes, there are prizes, I'll talk about those next time once we're kind of into it. Yeah. I have mentioned them before but I'll, I'll talk about them again next time. But it's a very relaxed, very casual knit along. So there'll be one thread where you can chat, you can post photos of in progress and finished things and I will draw the prizes from that thread. Now, if you don't use Ravelry, as always, you can always email us a photo if you want to, and we will add it in. 
that's how it's, it's sort of going to work whips are included knit whatever you like it's just got to be in self striping yarn and let, let's have a bit of fun through september so i'm going to show you what i'm going to be knitting with very exciting i've got my bag and my yarn all ready so i've got another moo and mouse bag from emma because yeah addicted and this one has got a more like autumnal theme can you see there's like a cat with a pumpkin oh lovely somewhere here and it's got owls and mushrooms and it's just beautiful so that's the bag I'm going to use I'm using double points again and this time I'm using their wooden again but these ones I love I've used these lots of times these are Knit Picks Sunstruck and they're just a natural coloured wood and I love them so I'll be using double points and my yarn, now Bryony chose this. I, I got loads of myself striping out for her the other day and I lined them all up on the carpet. I said, right, pick your favorite five and then we narrowed it down from there. And this is the one that she chose. And it's from Freckled Whimsy. Isn't that lovely? And this colorway is called Spooky Kitty Remix. So it's a Halloween themed yarn, which actually works perfectly because if I don't finish these in September, I can carry on knitting them in Sockerween. Yes. Perfection. It's the perfect warm up event. I know. So I'm going to get this wound up. I'm not sure if I'll just do a plain vanilla sock at the moment or if I'll do something else. I think I'm going to do a, I'll do contrast heels definitely, but I think I'll do my butterfly heel this time. But yeah, those will be on the needles next time won't they because we'll be into september the next time we record so that's our self-striping september Thank and it's you. open to everyone perfect i don't know if i said that it's everyone everyone come and join us have i said everyone for enough. our self-striping fun yes anyone can join in and knit themselves up some beautiful self-striping yarn what other endy bits have you got? so i'm going to talk more about this yarn in the next show but I bought some West Yorkshire spinners recently. This one I've had for a little bit. This one is the Robin colourway. A lot of you will know this colour. But then they put out some new bird colourways recently and this is what motivated me to buy a couple. Now one of them I haven't got here to show you because I did cast it on but I'm going to talk about that in the next show. I say I did cast it on but I bought a couple of others as well. This one is Swallow. And I got this one because it's red, white and blue. And I just thought, oh, that's very patriotic, isn't it? And then this is, sorry, this is their signature four ply. And then I got milk bottle because that kind of just goes with everything. I've got a lot to say about this yarn, but I'm saving it for the next show. But I just wanted to let you know that I'd bought a few skeins. Then the other thing I saw when I go on to Wool Warehouse, which is often, <laughs> I always look in the new yarns section and this one popped up this time and it looked really interesting so I thought I'm going to get a couple of skeins of that and do a review on it and it's from King Cole. I do really like King Cole as a brand. I think they've been around forever and I, I particularly love their bamboo cotton. I knit a blanket for Bryony years ago, a log cabin blanket which is still on a bed. It's been on a bed for years. It's you know, it, it looks like it did when I first knit it. It's brilliant yarn. But this one is called Homespun Prism Double Knitting. And this colourway I got is Yuletide. Look at that. It's a bit neppy. And the combination of yarns is quite interesting. It's 22% merino, 22% alpaca, 23% polyamide, 23% acrylic and 10% viscose. So it's a nice, interesting mix. It feels really nice and soft. It does have a little bit of alpaca prickle. And they come in 50 gram skeins. Now I'm gonna question the DK weightness of this. That's the first thing I would say because it's 175 meters, 191 yards for 50 grams. I don't know if that feels, I don't know if that is that DK. I mean, maybe it is a DK yardage actually, but it just the look of it, it's a two ply. It kind of looks a bit skinny to me. It's hard to tell on screen, I know. It looks a bit skinny to me for a DK. 
but I thought it would make some nice socks because of the combination of yarns in there, uh, fibres in there. There's loads of like strength, polyamide, acrylic, viscose, loads of strength in there. So I think they'll make a great pair of socks. So I'm going to do a review on that, but it's really nice. It looks, you know, it seems really nice. We're getting ready for our next patron-only show. It'll be available to watch on the 27th of August. If you would like to watch live, you need to be a silver, gold, or platinum patron. Yeah. Every patron can watch after the live show is finished. So it's live at 2 p.m. British summertime, and then the show is available for you to watch whenever you like from 10 past 3 on the 27th of August. We yeah. will be... Officially closing the summer of stitching, we'll be taking a much closer look at the next platinum pattern and all the platinum patterns from this year. And yeah. we will also be getting ready properly for Sockerween, as well as talking a little bit more about the self striping cow and all sorts of other lovely things. So that's our next patron exclusive show coming up on Sunday, the 27th of August. And that's it, ladies and gentlemen. Wow, well, that was a lot, wasn't it? That's an Ooh, awful lot. That was fun. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you, everybody. And we'll be back in two weeks with a brand new video show featuring yeah. my favourite blanket. My favourite blanket. Take care, everyone. We'll see you soon. See you soon. Bye. Shuffle!